Brian, Ryan, and Patrick. We're here today to discuss the potential acquisition of Take-Two Interactive by Electronic Arts. Over the last five years, Electronic Arts has done a phenomenal job preparing itself for the digital age of gaming. At the same time, Take-Two Interactive has focused on developing core, classic brands and catering towards hardcore gamers. Although we believe an acquisition of Take-Two would be in line with EA's strategic vision, we do not recommend an acquisition at this time, as Take-Two's valuation is too high. Taking a look at Take-Two, it's a multinational game developer, which really focuses on creating quality games, as well as appealing to its uh, core customer base. It generates most of its revenues from the key franchise, uh, Grand Theft Auto, which in 2014 accounted for nearly 60% of revenues. As you can see in our financial summary, there was a huge spike in that year, and the market largely rewarded the company for that. We'd also like to highlight that most of the company's revenues come from its console business, and it does lack a significant digital business. Compare that with Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts has made digital platforms a focus. It made two acquisitions within the last five years, and 45% of its current revenue comes from the digital side of things. If it were to potentially acquire Take-Two, we believe that this is an area in which it could leverage the platform to create synergies. So one other area of difference between two firms is in firm culture, as well as the difference in um, game development philosophy. So Take-Two is well known for being uh, producing really high quality games, often delaying release of products to make sure they achieve that. On the other hand, EA is perhaps characterized more by discipline with uh, following fixed product release schedules. Um, so integration risk does exist if we were to try to um, impart the same kind of game development philosophy on Take-Two Studios. So this includes problems like retaining talent, uh, revenue dissynergies, or also, um, you know, given the sizable equity component of the deal, making sure that Take-Two shareholders are comfortable with the pro forma company. So what we, what we advise EA do is actually to um, guarantee the autonomy of Take-Two Studios as part of the merger agreement. Um, we've seen this done before in previous transactions in this space, uh, notably of Activision acquiring Vivendi in 2007, um, as well as EA has also done the same for some of their own studios in-house, like notably BioWare. So Ryan talked about one of the key risks with the transaction. I'm going to flesh out a few other of the transactional risks that we see. The largest one is with GTA's popularity. This deal really hinges on GTA being a success, and if consumer trends were to shift away from this game, it would be detrimental in terms of the financial value. Another key risk is Take-Two's lack of mobile and social games. EA has recently stated that this is a strategy that they'd like to explore, and has shown this through its acquisitions. However, acquiring Take-Two would really be a strong movement away from this, and more towards its traditional business. The last thing we would like to highlight is the uh, risk of non-engagement. While EA could acquire Take-Two, Take-Two is also an acquisition target for some of EA's competitors, and, and uh, a competing deal may weaken their position in the industry. There are also a number of key stakeholder groups whose interests we need to consider when we're structuring a successful transaction. From the standpoint of EA shareholders, the core question is, does a deal make sense strategically, and does it make sense and create value financially? We believe that an acquisition of Take-Two makes sense and is in line with EA's core strategy, but price remains a hurdle in getting a successful transaction done. Another uh, interesting point is that Vanguard and BlackRock own about 20% combined in both firms. From the standpoint of Take-Two, they've done a great job uh, the management, that is, has done a great job in managing the core franchises, such as Grand Theft Auto. And we believe that there are mutual benefits to be had by integrating their management team with EAs. So we previously tried to make an attempt to buy out um, Take-Two before in 2008, and we failed. So what's changed since then? So there are a few, few key things we look at. The first is the release pipeline for Take-Two. So when we made the offer in 2008, that came just a few months before GTA 4 was scheduled to be released. Whereas an offer now would come a full year after GTA 5's release. So in terms of from the perspective of Take-Two shareholders, it looks much less like we're trying to front run um, their big cash flow event. Um, they're more likely receptive to the deal. On the other hand, with share price as well. In 2008, Take-Two's share price was at cyclical lows, whereas right now it's up about 60% um, from a year ago. So even though our offer premium now may be a lower percentage basis, on an absolute basis, the offer may represent a better deal. Also, with franchise validation, uh, since the, over the past seven years, GTA has put up two new titles and again, shown its staying power as a uh, solid franchise. 
and also with my, uh, macroeconomic conditions. Uh, capital markets, uh, both equity and debt capital markets, are definitely more conducive for a deal now than they were in 2008. Before a whole lot of sense qualitatively. From a strategic standpoint, a deal capitalizes on this trend towards open world games, open world genre, and Grand Theft Auto is one of the crown jewels within this space. Operationally, we believe that there are significant benefits from a risk pooling standpoint and from synergies, which we will discuss later. Financially, Take Two's earnings are incredibly uh, lumpy as a result of its reliance on Grand Theft Auto, and investors, as a result, apply discount to these earnings and cash flows from a normalized basis. We believe a transaction would unlock this financial value. So to move on to the financials, uh, in our merger analysis, we first looked at the base case valuation of Take Two, and you can see that we use relatively conservative synergy assumptions of about one percent marketing and three percent GNA. Um, and given an offer price of 34.84, that's about a 25 percent premium. Um, this offer, you can see, actually comes up significantly above uh, what you expect given our DCF valuation, present transactions, as well as comparable companies and analysis. In our optimistic case, there's three key areas where it differs from our base case assumptions. First is in the financing. In our optimistic case, 85% of the deal would be financed through debt. We think this is feasible given the fact that in 2008, in significantly worse debt market, EA was successfully able to raise funds for an attempted acquisition of Take Two. Looking at the synergies, we first would like to highlight cost of goods sold. We think that the move towards a higher margin digital platform will be able to save money there. We also think that there is optionality in being able to further juice earnings by reducing administrative and general expenses in a more optimistic scenario. So while we discuss the uh, optimistic scenario and how the deal would make financial sense, we think that any deal that EA would go ahead with should err on the side of financial prudency and you should rather look at the base case assumptions to ensure that the deal will create value. Um, looking at our uh, accretion dilution sensitivity table, we looked at different share price uh, offer prices as well as the percent equity contribution. And we've really narrowed a price between $29 and $32 as a good place where EA could acquire Take Two. However, at the current uh, stock price of Take Two, we don't think that this is feasible. Therefore, our recommendation is that although the acquisition would make fine, uh, strategic sense, from a financial standpoint, EA should wait and see if we can get a better deal in the future. Thank you very much. franchise game and uh, you're seem to be very caught up here on accretion and dilution in the near term and, and I agree at 5 or 15 percent it's not going to fly but I mean, why don't we reach a little bit here this is a true franchise that has been built and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down I mean it feels like we're being a bit conservative here sure um, so I, I do agree with that um, you know with a, with a company like Take Two, where they do build most of their revenue uh, off of one one big title, um, and again, it's a solid title. But as we highlight in the risks portion, I think you have to balance that against you know changing appetite of, uh, of consumers as well. You know, especially in this age where a lot of a lot of things like games in particular or entertainment in general taste do change very quickly. So we're also cognizant of, of being too uh, projecting too far ahead of time, and you know a lot of your projections might not necessarily make too much sense. Um, if you're looking at, you know, something like seven, eight years uh, into the future. You've uh, just indicated that we should be patient and wait for an opportune time. What are the catalysts that would present themselves that kind of define that time? <clears throat> One thing that we do think is possible is that because uh, Take-Two is so reliant on Grand Theft Auto, if we do see some struggles in some of their other franchises that aren't these rock star games like Grand Theft Auto, that it could put the company in a position where ownership would be more willing to sell, uh, or if there is a reason for uh, stock price decline that we think uh, would be beneficial for Take Two's management to sell, that's something that we can also see as a catalyst. Um, I, I heard you say that this made strategic sense and operational sense, and yet your primary argument against doing the deal is the dilution that results. How did you factor in that dilution into your structuring around equity and cash? And why the mix you have 
uh, laid out in the presentation. Um, sure. So in terms of the amount of equity we're, we're offering, obviously offering more equity does make a deal more dilutive, but we were cognizant of the fact that in this space, uh, debt is something that's not necessarily looked at incredibly favorably. If you looked at EA's uh, main competitors, almost all of them are, have net cash positions, and this is largely because of the, the development of the games themselves is very cash intensive, and then you don't receive the, uh, the payout for a while, and then there's also a lot of risk as to whether the game will be successful. Uh, even the top studios have a number of flops. EA, Take Two, those are no exception to that rule. And therefore, we think that the, the company should not over lever. Um, and while, you know, obviously uh, using more debt would increase the, uh, the creation of the deal, we think that that's a risk that EA should not take. Well, <clears throat> well I appreciate um, the idea of not doing a deal and not getting paid any fees. It's an unusual, it's an unusual position for a bit. Um, just can you walk me through sort of if you obviously Vanguard and BlackRock are your largest shareholders and largest shareholders in both companies. Okay, in absolute terms, my larger position as a portfolio manager is in EA. Okay, so then to in order, you know, if you are offering a large cash consideration, then wouldn't it make sense for me to do the transaction to actually reduce my position? And I also challenge you on your your ownership post deal. It never goes above ten percent. Okay, but anyways, uh, apart from that, um, wouldn't it make sense for me as a shareholder to do the deal to reduce my overall position? Yeah, we definitely think that that is something that we've looked at and talked about before. We think that uh, there is a lot of push from both BlackRock, or there would be a lot of push from both BlackRock and Vanguard to get a deal done. Um, however, we're looking at the company in a larger picture, and uh, although the two largest shareholders do make up a considerable portion, we think that they're able to get those benefits uh, that in a later date as well. And so that's something that we also um, took into consideration. Um, and just to go off a little bit, we did also provide a different recommendation, um, if you were uh, curious about that. Um, it's in the appendix. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much.